I want to encourage you to have your outlines in front of you. We're going to be talking about the Lord's Supper this morning. You know, when we think of uh, the Lord's Supper, our thoughts run in many important directions. I think some people think, well, communion is a, a great time and place to confront my own personal sin and commit myself to purity. Uh, others remember the old communion tables, and we have one that's in the, in the foyer, and on the front of the communion table was written, do this in remembrance of me, and we think of communion that way. And those are good ways to think of communion. What I want to give you this morning are seven features of the Lord's Supper. And hopefully you'll grab some of these and latch on to them. And as you come and take communion this morning, uh, that particular piece of the Lord's Supper will just grow in your hearts and God will minister to you in a special way. Uh, when we come to the Lord's table, we remember Christ's saving work on the cross. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 25 to 26 says this, In the same way after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what the Lord is saying to us is that we need to remember his sacrifice. And if we remember his sacrifice, we need to remember our deliverance through that sacrifice. He says to us, I want you to remember my payment for your sin. And therefore we should remember our forgiveness that we've received from Christ. We need to remember his death so that we might have life eternal. And we need to remember that he crushed Satan, canceled hell for everybody that would believe. And when we begin to think about what Christ did on the cross and what we have received, it ought to spur in us a great attitude of thanksgiving and praise and also humility. And I think if there was any aspect of the Lord's Supper that we dwell on when we take communion, this is the one thing that stands out to us, and that is his sacrifice, his death in our place so that our sins are forgiven and so we can spend eternity with him. But there's a lot more to it. When we come to the Lord's table, we see a partaking of the Christ, of Christ's presence. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says this, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Now the word participation, the Greek word for participation, is the word koinonia, where we get the word fellowship, we get the word communion. So when we take the bread and we take the cup, there is real fellowship, there's real communion that can take place between us and Jesus Christ. There's a real sharing of his life, a sharing of his body and his blood. Now that doesn't mean that we literally, when we take the bread and take the cup, that literally we're holding the body and the blood of Christ. It's not even saying spiritually that we're holding the body and the blood of Christ. But it's saying to us that when we come and we take that bread and we take of that cup, there is a real communion, a real fellowship with the person of Christ that goes on during that time that we take communion. I honestly cannot think of a time that in my adult life that when I have come and taken the bread and the wine that I didn't feel incredibly blessed to have a Savior who is Jesus Christ. When I held the bread and held the cup, many times I'm overwhelmed with what he did for me. It causes me to just well up inside with a desire to thank him and to praise him. There have been times that I've sensed his smile, not because I'm good, but the smile was like, you're mine. 
I love you. It's like a dad smile on his son, mom's smile on his daughter. Just a sense of knowing that God and I are communing and there's something going on between us at communion. That's what that verse is talking about. Sort of liken it to fervent prayer. When it's just you and God all by yourself and you're pouring your heart out to him and as you're praying, you begin to sense the presence of God filling that room. That's what can take place at communion. You know, liking it to times that you've been singing some songs, praising God, doing it with a large group of people, and the voices are just surrounding you, and all of a sudden you find yourself being lifted into the presence of God. Tears form in your eyes. Sometimes they run down your cheeks. Sometimes you're just so overwhelmed with the presence of Christ in that singing that you can't even sing anymore because you get choked up. That's what can happen at the Lord's Supper. When you and I take the bread and take the cup and think about what Christ has done for us, all of a sudden the Lord Jesus Christ can move in in a very powerful way and let us sense the fellowship that we have with him. The Lord's table, we also commune with each other as the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 17 says this, Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all share the one loaf. You know, when we take the bread and the cup, every believer who takes the bread and the cup is at the same level. We all were sinners. We all needed a Savior. Every one of us who partake of the bread and the cup have had to come to a point in time where we bowed the knee before the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaimed him as our Lord, proclaimed him as the Lord and our Lord, and we are all one in Christ. You know, at the foot of the cross, we're all equally in need of God's grace. We're all equally We've all equally received his grace, which was unmerited and unearned. The scripture says that there's one body, there's one spirit, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. There is a spiritual unity that takes place among God's followers when we come and we kneel at the altar and take the cup and the bread. We are all equals. Now, today is World Communion Sunday. That means that today, maybe a billion Christ followers are going to gather at an altar. They're going to take the bread. They're going to take the cup. They're going to hold it in their hand. And they and we are reminded that we are one with maybe a billion other people who have bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. And every one of us came to faith the same way. We recognized we were sinners, that we needed a Savior, and we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Savior. We are all one with the body of Christ. You know, they are people that we've never met. They're people that we haven't heard their testimonies. Yet every person who was born again of the Spirit of God, who came to Christ, they came to Christ knowing they were sinners, and they needed a Savior, and that Savior was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord reminds us at communion that all believers are one in Christ. Number four, we come to the Lord's table to worship in the holiest place. 1 Corinthians 10, 20 to 21 says this, the sacrifice of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. What Paul is trying to say is our, our devotion to Christ needs to be singular. We are devoted to Christ and no one else. Now the church of Corinth, they came out of a culture of paganism, of false religions, of occult practices, of demon worship. 
their feasts and their festivals were all opportunities for people to praise these false gods and really were praising demons. And Paul says, when they came to the Lord's table, they came to commune with the Lord, and they should not go back out into their community and get involved in pagan feasts and pagan festivals where Satan rules. So they needed to draw a line and say, listen, now that I've trusted Christ, I'm leaving that lifestyle behind and I'm choosing to be totally devoted to Jesus Christ. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. I owe him everything. Paul's saying, come apart. Paul's saying there's no room for mixed loyalties. There's no room for hanging on to anything that's false or anything that's in the darkness. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is our Lord. Our worship, our life needs to be singular. It needs to be focused on Jesus Christ. And when we gather at the Lord's table, we are telling Jesus once again, you are my Lord. And at this table, I don't know how many of you have done what I've done, made a fresh commitment to the Lord that I'll follow him and no one else. That needs to take place every time we bow before Christ and take the bread and the cup to say to the Lord, I make a fresh commitment to you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. I am going to serve you and you alone. Number five. Coming to the Lord's table leads us to a place of purification. Uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight 28 says this, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Uh, there's a song that we sing in the second service called Refiner's Fire. And there's some words in there. It says, Purify my heart. Let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart and let me be as gold, pure gold. Refiner's fire, my heart's one desire is to be holy. Set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy. Set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Purify my heart. Cleanse me from within and make me holy. Purify my heart. Cleanse me from my sin deep within. When we come to the Lord's table... We're saying to the Lord, I need you to purify my heart. I need you to bring about this holiness that I desire in my life. I ask you to cleanse me from my sin, not just the stuff on the surface, but the stuff that's deep within me. The Lord's table is a place of self-examination. We don't come to the Lord's table haphazardly. We don't come superficially. There is to be an honest examination of our own spiritual condition. And the results of honest evaluation ends up with confession, ends up with repentance. And we tell him, I desire to be pure and holy with you. If we don't examine ourselves, the Bible tells us that we're inviting the chastening hand of God over our life. Now, Many times the chastening hand of God is simply that God doesn't restrain the results of our sin. Other times, his chastening may be that he brings weakness into our life or sickness into our life or even premature death. I would say it's a good reason to have communion on a regular basis and to have it often so that we can sit back and say, God, am I right with you? Am I clean? And I want to let you know something. If you say to God, as you kneel here, God, is there anything that I need to deal with? I will be silent and listen. If there is something he wants you to deal with, you will hear it like that. You will know it almost before you say, Lord, what is it that I need to deal with? You will know it like that. And if God does it like that, we ought to immediately repent and get clean before him. The sixth thing is the Lord's Supper's proclamation. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 says, 
For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we proclaim the cross, we celebrate the cross, we joyfully proclaim that the Lord gave his body and his blood for us on the cross, and we proclaim that the cross is, has brought about the new covenant. You say, what is the new covenant? I know it says right there, this blood is the new co- or this is the new covenant in my blood. What does he mean by new covenant? You ought to write this down. I don't think you have a problem remembering it. I think it's clear as day. Here it is. I will forgive your sins for all time. No more sacrifices. I'll forgive your sins for all time. No more sacrifices. Jesus' death was the last sacrifice, and he gives total forgiveness forever. He gives eternal life forever. No more sacrifices necessary. Just remember that. Jesus was the last sacrifice, and he signs that covenant in his blood. Jesus paid it all. He died in our place once and for all, offers us forgiveness if we will believe he did it for us. We need to make it personal. I'm going to give you a chance to make it personal this morning. I'm going to say something. I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me. It's very simple. Jesus died for me. Say that with me. Jesus died for me. Jesus paid for my sin. Say that with me. Jesus paid for my sin. Jesus gave me eternal life. Say it with me. Jesus gave me eternal life. Just remember, if you were the only one who received him as Savior, he would have died for you. And you could have stood before 8 billion people and said, Jesus is my Savior. He died for me. But billions of people have bowed the knee to Jesus. And they say the same thing. He died for me. Number seven, the Lord's Supper anticipates the kingdom of God. The Lord's Supper anticipates the kingdom of God. Now, let me just give you a little background here. Jesus is spending the Passover with his disciples. It is the last time he's going to take the Passover meal with his disciples. He's sharing that Passover meal, and during that meal, he replaces the Passover meal with what we know as the Lord's Supper. He breaks the bread and he tells them that this is his body for them. He takes the cup and he says this is his blood that is poured out for them. He talks about the new covenant. And then he says in Matthew chapter 26 verse 29, he says this, I tell you I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. He anticipated the coming kingdom of God on the earth. And he said he wouldn't participate in the Passover meal or the Lord's Supper until the kingdom of God came on the earth. And the kingdom isn't here yet. But one day, one day, when you and I are in the kingdom... And the kingdom is populated with people that God has said are worthy to enter into that kingdom. Christ will sit down with you and with me physically. And he will take the Passover meal, which looked forward to the cross. And he'll take the Lord's Supper, which looked back at the cross. And we will celebrate the full redemption of God's plan of redemption for you and me. We'll celebrate it. Jewish people who will be there, will have been resurrected, will say, ah, that's what the Passover was all about. And you and I will sit back and say, whoa, wow, did you ever miss it? (laughs) You know, and, uh, but we will celebrate that together. There is a coming kingdom. And we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper and the Passover meal with the Lord himself. Let me just encourage you to uh, take this message and 
Think about what we talked about. The Lord's Supper helps us remember the saving work of Christ on the cross. It helps us celebrate our fellowship with Christ and with other followers of Christ. It helps us worship solely devoted to Jesus. It leads us to a place of purification. It proclaims the cross and it helps us anticipate the second coming of Christ and the establishment of his kingdom on the earth. The Lord's Supper is a blessed, blessed event.